had said before this was the uh, they are not clear how many artillery pieces were here there was a small force here that was no match for the greatest cavalry charge the largest in American history that swept up the Martinsburg Pike overcame Fort Collier and ended the third battle of Winchester it's a little hard to see that today because you're inside the fort and the uh, the lines of the uh, fortifications aren't as sharp, but essentially it's a six-pointed star. Uh, that was apparently, uh, uh, at least Milroy believed, one of the best type of forts to build. And uh, the short version of its preservation was a local living history reenactment group first took an interest in it long before this housing development ever uh, came to be. And they began to, to uh, uh, raise money to preserve it and take care of it. They used to have encampments here. But then that kind of petered out, and then it got overgrown. When I got here in 2009, it had just under, uh, come under control of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation. But they hadn't been able to do any work yet, and it, it was just covered in vegetation. Very thick vegetation. The trails didn't exist. Yeah, the trails didn't exist. The signage wasn't here. That's all in the last four or five years. Uh, they created, uh, the, they, they helped... What one method of, of preserving this and also funding its preservation and management was quite creative. Uh, there was concern as this housing development went in, of course, that this would be built upon and destroyed. So preservation groups like the SBVF, the foundation, got involved and began to try to work with the county commissioners to come up with some kind of way to save the fort. And what they decided to do was uh, they would block out this chunk of land here in the middle of this housing development for preservation they would turn control of its management over and ownership over to SVBF, and then they would also, so the county wouldn't have to fund it, and, and, and SVBF would be relieved of some of their financial responsibility, charge a special surtax to all the uh, uh, residents who are building homes in this area. So that money has to go directly back to SVBF, which has to be put towards preservation of this fort, which sounds like a great idea on paper, and the fund began to build up, but SVBF at that point was so... Young and so this is all happening in the early 2000s, mid to mid 2000s, 2008 or so. That that this isn't a priority project. They hadn't started working on it yet, and then some of the homeowners began to understand. Hey, I'm paying a special tax. What are they using this money for, huh? And by that point, uh, the kids were riding their you know ATV uh, wheelers all over the fort. Great, it makes a great bike ramp, you know. Uh, they actually bulldozed this point of the star. That's now a trail leading into it, but at the time, that was one of the points, the main board, and that's how that, that got destroyed. But eventually, uh, SCBF used that fund, used those funds to do the work that you see here today, and now it's, it's well-preserved. And we used it quite a bit during the 150th anniversary uh, sesquicentennial cycle to use it for interpretation. Again, it's heavily involved in 2nd uh, Winchester, uh, Milroy's main forts just south of us on Apple Pie Ridge. This is, again... Uh, uh, the fort just north of it, there was, they no longer exist, but there's a line of fortifications around uh, farther north on the ridge, infantry fortifications. Some of those still remain out here if you walk the outside trail. And I encourage you, if you have time at the end, we'll see, Jonathan, if we have time. If you walk the outside trail, you'll see not only those remains of the infantry fortifications that are still left on this property, the rest are, are unfortunately gone with the housing development, but you also want to notice how deep the trench is on the outside still, the ditch, and how steep the walls are. That's very important. Uh, long story short, uh, Yule's uh, Corps, when it came up here uh, uh, from Front Royal uh, leading the uh, invasion uh, through the valley that would lead to Pennsylvania and Gettysburg, uh, bypassed uh, the, the main Union force south of town on Bowers Hill and decided to make this long roundabout march with Early's division and launched their first attack against West Fort. If you look out here to your west about a mile, you'll see a ridge out there, wooded. That's west. That, that's uh, the next. That's actually Apple Pie Ridge. I'm sorry. And that's where West Fort was. That was attacked and overrun. Milroy's forces fell back here. Uh, they exchanged fire between them, the, the two forts, and eventually that night Milroy tried to evacuate uh, uh, going down the Valley Pike and then was eventually overwhelmed at Stevenson's Depot. Uh, here at 3rd Winchester, while some historians disagree that this fort was involved at 3rd Winchester, I think there's enough evidence to indicate this was held by some Confederate force, probably lightly held by uh, uh, Confederate cavalry, I'm not, I'm not positive myself, but it was attacked, we know, by Union cavalry because the officer leading the attack against this fort would eventually be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions. Do you want to talk about that? Yes, uh, this is a, uh, this is a uh, 
uh, occupied by some force of, of Confederates. It is uh, in support uh, with the uh, uh, the main entrances into uh, uh, Winchester from the north and west uh, goes by Fort Collier and then is also commanded uh, by guns uh, from in, uh, the Star Fort. That would be the railroad and the, uh, the, uh, the Valley Pike. Uh, and they advanced the big charge that Custer writes about that was read to us is uh, in, I think he says, five brigades. And you take five brigades and string them out from uh, coming coming down the uh, Valley Pike toward uh, Fort Collier, uh, they would reach over into this area here. And uh, the uh, and among the regiments that are moving against this area is Colonel Schoonmore, Schoonover's uh, brigade. And uh, they're rather colorful in their uniforms, called the butterflies, and uh, they will uh, be moving against this position. And uh, this is uh, uh, the fellow that wins the uh, becomes the recipient of the Medal of Honor will be a principal man in leading the attack on this area here that will secure uh, Fort uh, the Star Fort uh, because. Uh, the Confederates, as they retreat southward, are pulling through an area bounded on the west by us and extending eastward through Fort Collier to get back into their uh, inner defense line, which uh, bounds the area that's now the National Cemetery on the, on the east, and the north part of the defense line bounds what is the area of the National Cemetery on the north-south line. The, the soldier who wins the Medal of Honor actually has on his uh, Medal of Honor description, that's not the right word, statement, Citation. thank you, uh, he, would, he would lead the attack on Star Fort. I mean, it specifically says that. So to me, and along with what Ed just explained, that's enough evidence in my mind that this, this fort was definitely involved at, at 3rd Winchester. What was his name? Shoemaker, wasn't it? Yeah, Shoemaker. There you go, right Shoemaker. After the war, he <laughs> became president of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad. Well, there you go. Did you all hear that? No. I didn't even know that. Repeat that. After the war, he became president of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad. Shoemaker became the president of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad. Is that correct? Yeah. There you go. No. So on Shoemaker's sta statement, citation, it says this attack on Fort This is a very Sharp important Ford. battle. Uh, uh, on the road to Gettysburg. Milroy has been warned <laughs> that uh, a strong force of Confederates have come, uh, uh, passed through, uh, uh, through Front Royal and uh, are, in, uh, are in possession, Calgary, under Albert Gallican Jenkins of the Valley Pike south of there. He's warned by Halleck. Uh, Halleck and Milroy detest each other. Uh, Milroy, uh, being a graduate of Norwich, uh, the uh, northern equivalent of uh, of uh, uh, B -P uh, BMI, and uh, uh, being uh, uh, he has some delightful letters to his wife, but plus delightful letters. Uh, back and forth between he and Halleck. And he ends up telling uh, Halleck when he's warned to take his men out of here, let them come. And they are going to come. And in the Battle of uh, Second Winchester, uh, uh, Jackson, if he was alive, would be lusted to, to do as good as Ewell did in the Battle of Second Winchester. No, Yule at this time looks like the second coming. And I don't mean the second coming of Jesus Christ. I mean the second coming of Stonewall Jackson. That's the same and, thing. Uh, <laughs> and he fades, he fades from that. And all the Confederates uh, forget about uh, uh, Yule when he doesn't occupy Culp's Hill on the evening of the 1st. And uh, 
They all said they wished Jackson was there. But, uh, but uh, two weeks before, they're hitting him as the second Jackson, the second coming. Still going to do something they haven't done before. When the Medal of Honor is authorized, it's an AM, it's an enlisted man's medal. And uh, by the 1890s, uh, they're under enough pressure and they're going to make officers eligible for applying for the Medal of Honor. So that means if you thought you did, you could get affidavits and you were an officer, uh, you will apply uh, for a Medal of Honor. The board will review it. I know better. Paz and uh, and uh, George Smith Paz would be the father of the man who is. Uh, going to bother uh, George Smith Patton and uh, and uh, inform uh, uh, and he will be buried there first. When George Smith Patton too is there at West Point uh, is at, at uh, VMI, he's going to make arrangements to go to Baltimore and recover Uncle Taz's body and bury it with his father. Now, if you saw the movie Gettysburg, Uncle Taz appears in it. He commands the Seventh Virginia, and uh, and playing him in the movie Gettysburg is Ted Turner. And you can imagine what okay, reenactors who are very patriotic thought when they saw Ted Turner playing Taz Pat. Now, Taz Patton was not, now, Ted Turner is playing him, Maxwell has him shot in the heart. That's a clean wound. Actually, Taz was shot in the face. His yeah. jaw and tongue were ripped out of his mouth. So if you don't like Ted Turner, you wish he'd been shot the way Taz Patton had been, because he could not be Ted, Ted of the mouth. and ten dollars on that one. Oh no, right. That's almost the same percentage as Gettysburg. Now, uh, uh, Eric was very fortunate uh, because next to Arlington National Cemetery, uh, he works at the highest profile National Cemetery. I do, I agree, I agree with that. Yeah. Gettysburg is. Um,
One other thing I want to add, and I said this on my bus, is the fact that because preservation took so long to occur here in the valley of these Civil War battlefields, the first official preservation of battlefield land as a Civil War park didn't occur in the Shenandoah Valley till the centennial, the 1960s, when the first 200 acres uh, were purchased at Newmark. And almost all the acres that we're seeing now, uh, the various battlefields during our tour that have been preserved are all much more recent. So very recent successes. And why am I telling you all of this? Because when you go to Valley Battlefields, you're not going to see what, what you typically find at other Civil War parks, and that's monuments. When the veterans came back here uh, for reunions, and they did return for reunions in the 1880s and 1890s, there was no preserved poor battlefield land upon which to put monuments on, except for the National Cemetery. Because this is the final Confederate line. This is part of that fortified line where the Confederates made their final stand here at Third Winchester before being driven into the town. So it made sense for them to place the monument on the only ground where they could do so, which wasn't private property. So this is where you're going to find the, the other monuments you would typically find spread out across the battlefield to other parks. And just quickly as a, a listing, if you wander around, you'll see some of those. There's the 114th New York Monument. There's the monument to New Hampshire troops, another one to the Pennsylvania troops. Uh, 123rd Ohio, the 6th Army Corps has a monument here. The 8th Vermont, I want to talk about it in a second, they have a monument here. So that's an interesting story. 34th Massachusetts, 3rd Massachusetts Cavalry, and 18th, uh, 12th and 18th Connecticut. Those are the uh, principal monuments. There's also one to David Russell, who was killed here at the 3rd Winchester. Lastly, the 8th Vermont Monument was the only monument I know of placed on the actual field where the men did their fighting. They placed two monuments here at Cedar Creek, uh, excuse me, in the Shenandoah Valley, one here at 3rd Winchester, one at Cedar Creek. We'll see the Cedar Creek one uh, either tomorrow or Sunday. That's still in its original location. The 8th Vermont fought closer to Hackwood out in the middle field, uh, placed in 18, uh, 1885. Uh, it would be moved 10 years later in 1895. We at first weren't sure why the monument was moved, but it, when it was moved, it was moved here. So even though it says this marks the spot of their bayonet charge on September 19th, 1864, it, that is no longer accurate because the bayonet charge took place out in middle field. Uh, recently, Nick Perserno, who's a, uh, a past president and will soon be president again of the board of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation and a great preservationist here in the valley, he found a letter written from the state of Vermont requesting the War Department for its protection, they said, move the monument into the, the cemetery. Now, I'm guessing, I have no proof of this, I'm guessing that when the reunion took place where they dedicated that monument in 1885, who, sh uh, who showed up wasn't just the veterans from Vermont, especially the 8th Vermont, but also former Confederate soldiers returned <laughs> and for that reunion, and they both made speeches, and the Confederates said they promised to take care of the monuments here in the valley, to be their caretakers. And well, I'm guessing what happened was they meant every word of it, but then the ownership of that property changed. And I'm sure the new owner said, I don't want some damn Yankee monument on my land. And so that's probably what pushed the, the move to put the move. Oh, we don't need bulldozers. It's just full rock, full rock down. You can see they have a little bit of 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 a little bit Well, allegedly, Stonewall slept here. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at it. Oh, uh, well. It's all about how much, right? And here is your son. Uh, if you want to walk up that uh, lane, that lane is fairly easy to walk up, but you don't get up where they are. They go up there, probably never. Uh, near about how the church is, if you will pass, and they move up onto the slope of North Mountain. North Mountain is right there. And then they're going to file uh, to the, they're going to file right. They'll have Hayes' division on the right, they'll have Thornburg's division on the left. And they're going to be about halfway up to the crest of the mountain. Uh, and here you have the Confederate uh, cavalry scattered, uh, scattered from this area where we see this branch, I'll point that out, scattered up here, and, and they are generally facing this way. They're not facing toward 
Little North Mountain as they move up there. Now, uh, Wright's division, uh, Ricketts division, they will not, uh, they will not show but Rickett belongs to Wright. Rickett is in position in this area here. So Rickett will not advance until after, after uh, Crook has started these cavalrymen running in this direction, driving them in this direction. Uh, the final stop on the trail up here it tells you when they look and see these cavalrymen running back there behind them. So that naturally is not good for Ramser's division, particularly Grimes' brigade, to see men, to see their friends running this way. And of course, they're going to try to shift the Alabama brigade up there and to take position, but they're going to arrive too late. And soon Ramser's men will be doing this. And they're rolling them up just like you would a, you're laying your, Marshall Kolek likes to be in my scenario, he's laying linoleum in, in uh, his wife's kitchen. <laughs> and you know, he takes his hands off the linoleum and it rolls up and he has to do it all over again, oh, right? I hate Marshall? that when that happens. Yes. And that's what they're going to do, roll them up. And they're going to capture 22 cannons as they do it, as they run. And it's a perfect thing. Sheridan uh, hopes he has, so supposedly, Avro is going to take the lead. He's got the cavalry. And the infantry reach uh, Woodstock before the cavalry. So that means that uh, uh, Avro has worn out his welcome with the army. When the infantry reaches Woodstock, which is about nine miles south of here, before the cavalry does. And he's going to like it a lot less when he learns that uh, 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 the two divisions he's sent into the Ray Valley have not got beyond Overall Creek and are back at uh, back at Front Royal, because right now, if everything worked right, the Earth's army would have ceased to exist. We would have cut the whole bunch. We would have cut them all off, and it would, uh, the campaign would be over. Now, the Union, uh, uh, now, one of the heroes of the Confederate, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, of the Second Corps is Sandy Pedal. He is a, a Pres he's a Presbyterian divine. Uh, excuse me, he's an Episcopalian divine. Uh, he had been Jackson's chief of staff. He had been uh, passed on to Yule as his chief of staff, and now he is Ernie's chief of staff. And Ernie uh, probably is a trying soul because uh, what they, uh, they uh, finally talked early into going to church. <laughs> and they have a fundamentalist minister. And he presents to, uh, to the congregation, uh, this is at, just at the time of the Valley Campaign, before P P Pendleton dies. Pendleton's gonna be killed and die on the morning of the 23rd. He's going to have a fundamentalist preacher, and he's going to say, are you prepared when the dead rise, come to life? By the hundreds, by the thousands, Hurry leaps up and says, I'd conscript every damn one of them. <laughs> you know, another human interest story I don't on I'm Hurry. A toothbrush but uh, uh, Pendleton will rally about two guns, and he will be the last serious connection with Jackson's staff with the army and will die and, and will die as he as he makes a vain attempt to stop the Confederates as they flee up the valley. This was uh, uh, this was a route. They're gonna capture uh, twenty-two cannons. Uh, they're going to capture a large number of Confederates as you can see 
uh, here on the total of the uh, of the of what the results are in the battle here, and early will not be able to stop retreating until he, he gets uh, far up the valley. Beyond. The Yankees will go all the way to Harrisonburg. They'll go all the way to Dayton. Uh, they will uh, go all the way to Stanton. And uh, Early will fall all the way uh, back to the Waynesboro area, where he will be reinforced, uh, as we'll talk from the bus, by Kershaw. Kershaw had started, you remember, that it, that's what had triggered the battle of Cedar Creek. Uh, he's over at Gordonsville, a long way over in Piedmont, Virginia, and he has to get his tail back to the valley along with the artillery. So this is uh, a rather, and it's one of the first uh, successes when he start getting interested in preservation in the valley. When the uh, Association of Preservation of Civil War Sites is able to broker, which is founded in Night, uh, 2000, uh, night is founded in 1997. They're able to broker a deal to acquire this land here and get the local uh, reenactment group and the Sons of Veterans uh, to maintain the area for them. Uh, oh, you're giving it to me? Okay. Um, the only thing I want to add is if you walk the whole trail, as Ed said, it's quite long, and it would take you quite a while to do it, but it does eventually go to the very top of the hill, and one interesting feature, at the very top of the hill where Ramsar had his line is a battle witness tree, and it's so large you can see it today. It's still there. If you look straight up in this direction, towards the top of the hill, you'll see an evergreen bush, not quite to the top, and look just to the right of that, and above it, you'll see what's called this, the uh, signal tree. The Confederates use that. Uh, to put men up top to, to look out and, and watch the Union movements. One of the Sartre's groups has put in a small bench. There's a bench. The left, the left flank of Early's infantry line stood on this hill. Mm -hmm. ...over there, and then of course the Union Battle line would be in front of you. You're now facing uh, generally north, northeast. From here, even though we're not at the very top, the highest point where the Confederates were, you did get a, you still get a good idea. Again, why this position is seen as so formidable, so so strong. That's a naturally strong position. It stretches again from the base of the Massanutten to your right, and there's Signal Knob clearly visible again. All along these knuckles that describe, known collectively as Fisher's Hill, past this position all the way to Little North Mountain. Ramser's division holds the far left of the Confederate infantry. He would be located on this hill. Uh, the left end of his line is uh, where the witness tree is and that, that modern tree line today. And then everything else beyond that, all the way to back road, is held by Lomax's cavalry. Ed had described to you how uh, Early decided uh, uh, in the afternoon of the 22nd that he could not hold this position despite his strength. He simply did not have enough men, uh, 10,000 or less, now, this is uh, how he described it in, in his words. Well, where did he go? My line was very thin, he said, and having discovered that the position could be flanked, as isn't the case with every position in the valley, I determined to fall back on the night of the 22nd. So using the cover of darkness, he would retreat. He said, I knew my force was not strong enough to resist a determined assault. I also wanted to just quickly talk about Crook's march that Ed described. Again, they're using the back road and trying to keep it concealed. Uh, this is how Crook himself described it. I led the way in person, following my way up, 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 up a succession of ravines, keeping my eyes on the signal station on top of the mountain so as to keep it, our column, out of sight. 
making the color bearers trail their flags so they could not be seen. You don't want those flags waving. They attract a lot of attention. And so uh, by 3 o'clock, they were already marching up the slope of Little North Mountain, as I described, and literally, as you'll see on the map, squarely on the flank and literally on the rear of the Union Army before they launched their attack. Brigadier General Brian Grimes actually warned Ramser. He thought he saw something, tried to call his attention to it. And Ramser, for some reason, ignored it. He didn't understand what it was. And by the time he realized uh, the threat that was developing off to his left, it was too late, and the attack started at 4 o'clock. <laughs> just like Ed described so well, it was a total surprise, as if these men were just dropping out of the sky. The uh, Eighth Corps lined up their two divisions, and they just rolled down the hillside. Uh, one Eighth Corps soldier said, we went sweeping down their uh, works like a western cyclone. Every man for himself, firing w whenever he saw a rebel, yelling and cheering. Uh, Colonel Hayes, Rutherford B. Hayes, the men rushed on, no line, no order, all yelling like madmen. And the sight of the Confederate entrenchments inspired the men, uh, George, Colonel George Wells said, in sight of this, instead of checking the men, it seemed to inspire them with new order. Every man yelled, if possible, louder than before, and each regiment strove to be the first man uh, with its colors. It just crushed Lomax. Ramser tries to shift some of his men to face this new threat, to refuse his line. It's too little, too late. One brigade, you'll see in the map, is sent over there to try to extend that refused line. In the confusion of battle, it gets lost and marches literally off the battlefield, weakening the Confederate line even more. And then, as Ed described so well, the whole line just rolls up like a rug. And at the same time, the 8th Corps begins to crush this line and roll it up in this direction. Uh, Sheridan orders his other two corps to move into action. So now the Confederates are getting it from two directions. They're left and front at the same time. Here comes the 6th Corps rolling up uh, now what is no longer a... Uh, impregnable position because the Confederates are simply out overwhelmed and too distracted by this new attack. Then comes the 19th Corps following them and they just they just roll right over the Confederate line, sweeping it off the field in confusion. <clears throat> in the two segments, the uh, Valley of the West Fork and the Page of the Luray Valley on the other side. 55 miles, there's only one cross uh, mountain road, and that is at New Market Gap. Thank you very much. The tree is going to be up yep. in the vicinity. Of uh, that part uh, of the uh, see the dead tree. <laughs> Which Union skirmishers advancing at Fisher Hill? Colonel Joseph Kiefer, General Ricketts. The bullpens were. Uh, Ramsey's division took up positions on the ridge in front of you, which would be out here, and constructed bullpens, quote unquote, makeshift structures of fence rails covered with earth at about 1 p.m. on September 22, 1864, to distract Early's attention from Crook's flank march, which would be out to our left here. Sheridan then ordered the uh, Ricketts, 3rd Division, 6th Corps, to attack the bullpens. 2,200, mate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and they're very good runners. <laughs> the ones that can't catch their horses are going to be relying on, as they say, Shank Spare. Shank Spare would be your feet of getting you out of there as fast as you can. Hey, here's Mr. Sheriff for you guys. <laughs> and such at uh, Fisher's Hill on the uh, 22nd. He believes now and he, that the Confederates are le have left the valley. He has solved one of his missions. He has dispersed 
and beaten the Confederates decisively. He is certain in his mind right now that the Confederates are going to leave the valley. So on the 29th, he has reached Stanton, Virginia. Stanton, Virginia is the important station on, uh, on the railroad going into uh, the Virginia Central Railroad. And that is where he's going to re generally re remain where he is. He doesn't know that Early has continued to retreat, and he, after leaving uh, Harrisonburg and Stanton, Early has moved over near uh, 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 near Waynesboro, near Rockfish Gap, and Early will be joined at Rockfish Gap uh, by General Kershaw uh, and uh, his division. Remember, we said goodbye to Kershaw back there on our first stop yesterday. And he has gotten as far as Gordonsville, Virginia, when he gets orders to get your tail back to the Shenandoah Valley as fast as you can. And taking the way by way of Rockfish Gap, he will be back with General Early in, at the end of the uh, of the first week in October. He has him back. And Lee has decided, I'm going to give, give him my best cavalryman. Now, Lee's uh, uh, favorite, ca uh, the best one now that Stuart is dead, uh, of course, is Wade Hampton. But he cannot send off Wade Hampton. So he's going to uh, send off uh, Tom Rosser. Tom Rosser was in the same class at West Point as George Armstrong Custer. He was a native of Virginia, but had been admitted to the West Point from Texas. So he's known as Texas Tom. When Texas uh, withdraws from the Union on the first uh, day of February, 1860, uh, uh, 61, Texas Tom resigns and goes south. Uh, he will earlier be in the artillery, but will not follow his course. And of course, he and he and George are very, very good friends. George will not uh, get out of leave West Point until the twenty-second day of June, of course, of sixty of 61, and if Hazen had been, uh, uh, Hazen had his way, George Custer would have been kicked out of West Point, not graduated from West Point on the 22nd day of June, because he'd violated duty, honor, and country, and Custer's luck had saved him. Now, Custer's luck will hold good until about 4.30 in the afternoon on June 25th. 19, 18, uh, 1876, when his custom will, when his luck will turn bad. And uh, they, of course, uh, we back to Texas Tom, he commands the Laurel Brigade. Now remember that Fitz Lee has been badly wounded. Uh, he will not return to duty for some time. And maybe he can ship up. Uh, Jump up the Confederate cavalry. Tom is talking aggressively, and also while they're at Waynesboro, they receive twelve new cannons. Just, just proved in everything at Tredegar. So he's got back twelve of the of the twenty one cannons he's lost. More about that later on. So he has not left the valley. He has been reinforced in the valley. Sheridan doesn't realize this. And Sheridan then scatters his people out. Uh, and generally the cavalry is going to be doing it. Maybe they'd been do maybe there'd been more use if he'd used them to reconnoiter and find that Early has only retreated as far as Waynesboro and is being reinforced at Waynesboro. 
So now he's ready to do the second part of his mission. The second part of his mission is to uh, uh, make it in what Grant says is in mind, a crow in crossing would have to carry its ration. So he's going to spread the cavalry out. Avril has been fired. Uh, Sheridan doesn't like, he's not a Sheridan man. And of course, when Avril shows up in uh, uh, Woodstock after the infantry is there, it doesn't show that he's very good at pursuing the enemy even when they're breaking and fleeing. So he's fired. And he brings in Colonel Powell to command uh, uh, the division formerly commanded by Avril. Now, Avril's men, uh, uh, so Powell's men are going to be given the mission when they begin to retrograde from the valley. More about that in a moment. His route of leaving the valley will be by way of the Page Valley or the Ray Valley. And he'll retain two cavalry. Now he's also got rid of another. Uh, you have to be careful how he gets rid of the other one because the other one is even closer to General Grant than General Sheridan is. And that's James Harrison Wilson. Uh, if he had not been close to Grant, he would have been fired at the Battle of Wilderness. And they're going to send, he's going to detach him. And, and of course, uh, George Scott Custer is not a mire of James Harrison Wilson. Uh, and uh, when James Harrison Wilson leaves to become chief of the cavalry bureau in Washington, who gets his division? You know who? George Armstrong Custer. Merritt remains command of his division. Meanwhile, the uh, uh, Sheridan is in a debate uh, with uh, the, the Brain Trust in Washington. The Brain Trust in Washington and, and Grant better than anybody. Now, General MacArthur would not be very good uh, because he doesn't understand the president is the commander in chief, <laughs> nor, did, nor, did, uh, nor did George McClellan nor did poor General McChristian more in recent days. Uh, the generals have trouble and don't remember who the commander-in-chief is. They don't ever really read their history books very well. And uh, Sheridan uh, uh, is given orders uh, coming down from, through, through from Washington, through Grant, uh, as soon as you devastate the valley, Conduct the second phase of your what your mission was. You have beaten Sheridan uh, Early's army. Uh, he's left the valley, but we know he hasn't left the valley, and he's been reinforced. Uh, I want you to cross the Blue Ridge, the Rockfish Gap, and I want you to come join me in Richmond, uh, in the Richmond Petersburg area. Sheridan will not be able to do this until March 1864. And because he wants him to do, do that, he'll conduct, conduct destruction on the, uh, on the, uh, the railroads uh, and the canals and carry destruction to Piedmont, Virginia and report to General Grant in the Petersburg area. Uh, Sharon doesn't think that he is going to argue against that. He says, I uh, uh, would pr prefer not to uh, move to uh, the Richmond Petersburg area and report to you by way of Rockfish Gap and to Piedmont, Virginia. I think it would be more practical if you let me uh, take my army, I can do the burning a lot more, a lot better. If you uh, let me return uh, to the lower valley and then send my men off uh, 
to join you in Richmond and Petersburg uh, by the best way, going through either Ashby or Snickers Gap and to Washington and by boat. He wins the argument. Grant has agreed, agrees to that. So Sheridan is now uh, freed of going through the uh, uh, Rockfish Gap through the Piedmont that way. So now he's going down the valley. So he's going to begin it on the sixth day of uh, no of of uh, of uh, of, um, of um, October. Powell will have the Page Valley, and he'll go down the Page Valley. That's on the other side of the Massanutten. Uh, Custer and Merrick uh, will have the privilege under the loose supervision of, uh, of General Torbert to go down the uh, more productive part of the valley. Merritt will keep his men on either side of the valley pike. He goes, uh, burning, continuing what they've been doing since the 29th, burning every barn they can find, burning every mill they can find, uh, uh, avoiding burning houses, uh, residences, uh, dry, either slaughtering or driving off the livestock, and uh, uh, converting the place into an uh, area where armies will have a tough time subsisting themselves. And they start down the valley. Merritt will spread his men out from the Massanutten here to the middle road using as his main axis, the Valley Pike. Custer will move his men down the back road, keeping his men reaching the North Mountain as well, uh, and to the middle road, dividing them. And they start down the valley. And, they're, and they start off fairly, uh, uh, it'll be an uh, army followed by a pillar of fire and smoke as they move down the valley, devastating it. And uh, the Confederates will pursue. Tom Rosser is very cocky. He thinks maybe I can take my Laurel Brigade and maybe I can put some fight in these Confederates that have been in the Valley Cavalry. Rosser will be on the back road. And with his command, the Laurel Brigade. And uh, he will uh, be very aggressive. Merritt is not as aggressive too, but not as aggressive in a nasty sort of a way as George moving down the back road. Uh, by, the by the ninth, uh, beginning on the seventh, on the seventh they're beginning to be attacked by the Confederate cavalry, suddenly rejuvenated, particularly uh, by Rosser. And if they catch you trying to set a fire, they're gonna, you're going to die. You're not going to die a present way. And he's pressing them hard. And he'll continue to press them hard until the night. Sharon is now getting urinated off. He's getting urinated off at Torbert. Torbert's supposed to keep his men burning, burning like he wants them to do. And they're beginning to get more cautious because if you're caught burning a building, you probably don't die a very pleasant death. You may have your neck, neck, your throat cut. So he's going to have a meeting with General Torbert. And it's very good. To, uh, we were in the shadow of where that meeting is going to be piking. If I, uh, I should have called it attention, we'll see it again many times. Just to, uh, as we walked into that, uh, where we relieved ourselves, to your left, there's a round hill. There are lots of round hills in the Shenandoah Valley. 
But this is around Hilda's important. And they have a meeting there. And the uh, orders that Sharon is going to give Torbert, go out and beat him or get beat yourself. Uh, and they, and Sharon is a person that likes to see his orders uh, carried out. So that means that he and Torbert, after Torbert is told, uh, after he's told Merritt and uh, Custer, and undoubtedly has sent a message, because he has, to, he cannot communicate directly with Powell, because Powell is over in the Luray Valley. And uh, Sheridan gets up on, if we want to be Sheridan today, we could be standing up on Round Hill. We wouldn't see as good as he does, because there were enough trees to go out and see how his men carry out the orders and see if they can beat uh, the enemy, or if they don't beat the enemy, the enemy will beat them, and they should the fall guy, if he beats them, will be Torbert. So they're going to fight two engagements. They're pretty well divorced from each other. So Custer is going to be in action on the back road, because that's his axis of advance. Uh, and Merritt is going to be in action on the, uh, the Valley Pike, because that's the action. Now, they're going to have to reverse their direction, because they've been falling back. Now they're going to have to change directions and go after the Confederates. And we will uh, now, uh, the advance contingent of 11 or 13, I don't keep track of figures like that, of your round table, we're out here with a fellow that knows the area very well. In fact, he even lives in a house uh, uh, and, and that Jed Hotchkiss does. And uh, uh, he tells what I had suspected. Very little is known concrete-wise what happens here as to detail. Uh, Tom's Brook in the area where we are uh, because he, uh, uh, he uh, uh, knows it much better than I do says there is not that much battle uh, information on the battle uh, between Lomax and, uh, and, uh, and Merritt's people on this road. But we know considerably about what happens because Custer's a plus pub publicity hound, uh, uh, Rosser's a publicity hound, and we know a lot of what's going to happen over there. And it's going to be rather exciting. Makes a good drawings for uh, the illustrated one, uh, that book that we saw uh, of Custer Bowing uh, on one side of a street of uh, Tom's Brook, uh, pulling his horse up tight uh, because that's where uh, our uh, the Taylor is. And on the other side, looking at him, is a uh, Tom Rosser, and they're more or less like a football game as they view uh, this deadly football game of killing and wounding. So, we're, so we will spend, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, have the church not having a, uh, a session or a wedding today, and we'll be able to be standing about where Custer is as they're showing their, as they're priming themselves showing how masculine they are preparatory to the battle. And then we can get back on the bus. Oh, the war really begins. And um, it's not a scorched earth policy as we envision it today in the 20, 21st century, but it's the most devastating type of warfare that's ever been inflicted uh, on a people up until this time, at least in American history. And they got to keep in mind that a lot of the people in the valley who are being burned out by these orders uh, we're not. I'm not saying that there weren't a lot of you know, pro-Confederate uh, sympathizers in the valley, and I'm not saying that a lot of these the valley families didn't support the Confederacy uh, with men and material, but a lot of the men, a lot of the families in the valley, you have to keep in mind, 
uh, were descendants of the original uh, settlers, and they had come from Pennsylvania. They were Mennonites, Dunkers, Quakers. A lot of them are, are peace-loving uh, people. They're, they're anti-war people, and many of them had not supported the Confederate war effort. When they tried to appeal to the Union soldiers, it was very uneven. Some soldiers said, I'm sorry, our orders are to burn, and they would burn anyway. Uh, and some families lost everything. Despite the orders not to burn houses, houses were burned. But the majority of, of, of the houses did survive. Those orders were respected. In other cases, Union soldiers sympathized with these farmers, probably reminding of their own farm families at home, and would do things to try to spare those families. In some cases, it was very uneven. Um, uh, and uh, so some families, again, were, were spared. Sheridan uh, later tried to justify the burning itself. And um, the Sky King. he described a th a, 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 an additional reason to, to burn out the valley, not just to, to make it a barren waste, as he said, or as Grant ordered. And to, so they would be able to supply Confederate armies, but also to break the Southern morale. This is how he put it. Now, he wrote this in his memoirs, but he said something very similar to this during the war itself. He said, those who rest at home in peace and plenty but see little of the horrors of war, and even grow indifferent to them as the struggle goes on, contending themselves with encouraging all who are able-bodied to enlist in the cause. There's another matter, however, when deprivation and suffering are brought to their very doors. Then the case appears much graver. Uh, Tom's Brook, uh, probably maybe three or four hundred yards above where we're going to cross it. And what do they do? They sweep in and will be coming in and striking uh, the Confederate, uh, turning their left flank in the area where you can see those two houses just to the west of the uh, field. So this is going to be the crucial charge. Uh, and the, you're going to have Pennington's Brigade participate in it, particularly the 5th, uh, 5th 18th Pennsylvania and the uh, 5th, uh, 5th New York. And, those, and Pennington's Brigade is going to be charging them in front uh, on either side of the road, mostly on this side of the road, when Wells sweeps into the rear, and that's going to be all she wrote. The beginning of the Woodstock races. They will not stop. They will not stop their flight. They'll be pursued about 16 miles. They, the Confederates have these five, 11, 12 new guns they've just gotten from Treadinger. And at the end of the day, these 11 of those 12 new guns will be in General Sheridan. Now, Ernie will describe this battle. He says, you know the laurel is a running vine. That is not complimentary. That's about as savage a critique as you can have uh, for a brigade and probably for Tom, Cus uh, for Tom Rosser. Steve, that tree line is Tom's throat. Okay, we'll be, uh, as Dad said, we'll be crossing it. We'll All right, to go up you the see hill. the car. Watch it. You're going to see it in about two minutes, uh, uh, about uh, 60 seconds. You're going to see it. There see it? See. You can yeah. see it there. That's now, remember, Wells is about 300 yards <coughs> west of that. And he, there he goes the car. And he's going to come in just about where that car is now and strike the Confederates in the flank and rear. And they're not going to stop running until they're 15 miles south of you. Where's the uh, Round Hill from here? Columbia River, it's Stones River, and plus Marshall gets out and looks at the bridge. His playing engineer decided we can take a bus across. This is uh, west of, uh, this would be uh, uh, east of uh, Spring Hill. 